So in this video, we're going to talk about the medication hyacinth butyl bromide. Now in the United Kingdom, this medication is easily available over the counter and it's sold under the brand name Buscapan. And this is such a well-known brand name that actually we almost always just use this as the name of the medicine rather than calling it the full hyacinth butyl bromide because this is such a mouthful. And unfortunately, you do need to say both words. You can't just say hyacinth because there is actually another form of hyacinth called hyacinth hydrobromide that does almost the same things as hyacinth butyl bromide, uh, but has slightly different effects because it also crosses the blood-brain barrier much better than hyacinth butyl bromide and that leads to it having added properties that this one doesn't have, effects on the brain that this one doesn't have and therefore it's used in different situations to this one. So uh, because of the fact that this name is such a mouthful we often just refer to it as buscapan in the UK. So this is a medicine that as I said earlier is easily available over the counter and it's really really cheap and you don't even need to go to a pharmacy to buy it. You can buy this on supermarket shelves. So if you go to the medication aisle of a big supermarket, you will see Buscapan there. And if you look at the packaging of that and look for the actual name of the drug, the proper name of the drug that's contained within it, you will see hyacinth butyl bromide. So hyacinth butyl bromide is in a category of medicines known as anticholinergics. And this describes the mechanism of action of the drug in the body, the pharmacological action of the drug, rather than what it's necessarily used for, what its clinical effect is. Indeed, these are the words that we'll use to describe its clinical effect in just a moment. But firstly, let's talk about its pharmacological effect. So there is a neurotransmitter in the body called acetylcholine, and I'll actually just write this down. So here we go, some fancy words from biochemistry and pharmacology here. So there is a neurotransmitter in the body that's used in many different places as a signaling molecule, often between nerves and associated cells, and this is called acetylcholine. Now, there are different types of acetylcholine receptors that the cell that is receiving the signal can have on their surface. And there are two main groups of acetylcholine receptors. There are nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and there are muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Now, anticholinergic drugs generally, they are drugs that actually block the muscarinic receptors rather than the nicotinic receptors. So usually, if a drug is described as an anticholinergic, it's actually blocking muscarinic receptors. The proper word would be to call it an anti-muscarinic rather than just calling it an anticholinergic, but that name is less beautiful, so often people just use anticholinergic. Uh, so the action then of hyacinth is that it binds to muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, does not activate them, but blocks acetylcholine from being able to bind to them, and therefore blocks the signal from being delivered. So let's now talk about clinical aspects of buscapan. So it comes as 10 milligram tablets, and these tablets are extremely small and very easy to swallow. And the typical dose is to take two tablets, so a dose of 20 milligrams, and of course this is the adult dose. If you're going to give it to a child, you need to look up the dose. I don't know paediatric doses off the top of my head. Whenever I prescribe anything for a child, I go to the paediatric BNF, and it usually has a dose that's specific to the child's age and weight. Uh, but this is the adult dose for buscapan. So it's two tablets, 20 milligrams, when required, and you can take it up to four times a day, so a maximum of 80 milligrams in a 24-hour period. So it's usually taken as an as-required symptom relief drug for its antispasmodic properties. However, some people have such dire need of an antispasmodic that they may end up being on it as a regular medication. The other situation that it would be prescribed as a regular medication is, is, is if instead of using it as an antispasmodic, we're using it for its anti-secretory properties, and we'll discuss more about that later on. So let's now discuss what this word antispasmodic means. So antispasmodic means that it has the ability to relax smooth muscle cells. So the main target for this is going to be the gastrointestinal tract. So the gastrointestinal tract is a great big tube going from mouth to anus uh, and most of that tube has within its walls smooth muscle cells. If you look at the esophagus, you look at the stomach, you look at the small bowel, you look at the large bowel, you look at the sigmoid colon, you look at the rectum, the wall of those structures, the wall of these tube structures 
contains smooth muscle cells. And those smooth muscle cells are continuously contracting and relaxing, and this is how the bowel moves. So inside of us, it is writhing around like a worm, effectively, and that is occurring because the smooth muscle cells in the wall are continuously contracting and relaxing uh, rhythmically. Now, uh, if the smooth muscle cells are particularly excited, then the movement of the bowel, motility of the bowel, is going to increase. So you can imagine it writhing around more violently inside. Whereas if they are relaxed, then movements inside are going to be uh, reduced. As I've said, antispasmodic drugs are drugs that relax smooth muscle cells. And there are smooth muscle cells outside of the GI tract that they will also exert their effect on. However, the main target for them usually is the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, and therefore, they are going to reduce the motility of the gastrointestinal tract. So you can imagine uh, the bowel writhing around less after you take this drug. And the reason that hyacine butyl bromide is able to achieve this effect is because smooth muscle cells have on their surface muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. And when that acetylcholine binds to those receptors and stimulates them, it stimulates intracellular um, signaling cascades that stimulate the cell to contract more. Uh, so acetylcholine and muscarinic acetylcholine receptors stimulate the smooth muscle cells and therefore stimulate motility of structures with the smooth muscle cells in, such as the bowel. And therefore, by blocking these receptors and blocking the acetylcholine acetylcholine's activity, you reduce motility. So let's talk about a few clinical examples of where this is used to illustrate this point. So one of the major conditions in which buscopan is used is IBS, or irritable bowel syndrome. Now, this is a controversial condition. Um, the etiology is controversial. It's not properly understood. I think a lot of people think, and indeed I'm of the opinion, that it is probably caused by undiagnosed food intolerances in the individuals who have it. So in this condition, people end up with a lot of abdominal pain, feeling sick a lot of the time, and usually a lot of problems with diarrhea and also abdominal cramps. Uh, so what happens is motility in the bowel for some reason is far too high. So stomach mobility, motility is too much and then the bowel motility is too much. When the stomach motility is too much, it creates the sensation of nausea. It makes you feel sick if your stomach's writhing around too much. When your bowel is writhing around too much, it triggers that sort of nasty abdominal pain and it also moves contents through it too quickly. Water then doesn't get absorbed adequately and you end up with diarrhea. Um, finally, if the smooth muscle cells are completely overexcited in a section of bowel, what can actually happen is the bowel goes into spasm. So if you imagine the bowel is a tube, imagine it now completely contracting down. Imagine if all the smooth muscle cells in the wall contracted as one, then the bowel would be contracted down, the lumen would completely shrink. And if it stays like that for you know 10 to 20, 30 seconds, uh, maybe longer minutes, that's what we call a bowel spasm, and that is extremely painful. It's felt as a really horrific pain that is called an abdominal cramp, a horrible crampy pain in your abdomen. So if your smooth muscle cells are completely overexcited in your bowel, that's what can happen. You can suffer abdominal cramps. So these are really the symptoms of IBS, feeling sick, abdominal pain, abdominal cramps, and diarrhea, and they get this every single day of their life. Maybe they all have some good days, but most days they're experiencing these problems. And at the moment, the etiology of it is still not properly understood. As I say, the big theory, uh, and the one that I generally subscribe to, is that it's something they're eating. They have some sort of intolerance to something they're eating. They haven't worked out what it is yet, but there's something they're eating that their bowel really just does not like. Uh, and is causing major irritation to the stomach and then the uh, small bowel and the large bowel and triggering this increase in motility that is resulting in all of these symptoms.
And uh, I think if they were able to identify what this is, and this is often what I advise people with IBS to do, to keep a diary, to look at what they're eating. If they're getting symptoms every day, it must be something they're eating every single day. Look at every single thing. Uh, try a few days without things and see if things improve. And if they see a marked improvement, then it probably is that food that has been causing all of these GI problems. There are alternative theories as to the cause of IBS, such as um, psychosomatic theories, that it's all related to um, anxiety or depression, and that that is um, causing problems with the bowel, because of course the brain controls the entire body. There's a huge number of nerves from the brain to the bowel. Uh, so maybe subconscious parts of the nervous system are at work here, and the um, problem up in the brain is manifesting down in the bowel. That's an alternative theory. I don't subscribe to that theory personally. I think it's, I personally am of the opinion that IBS is an undiagnosed food intolerance. And in different people, it'll be a different food that they're intolerant to. And that's the difficulty uh, in helping these people, that it's very difficult to work out what food it is. And really, it's on the person themselves. They need to work it out for themselves. And keeping a diary and trying to figure it out is what they need to do. However, uh, one of the medicines that we can give these people that can help relieve their symptoms is buscopane, and it usually is extremely effective. It calms all the smooth muscle cells down. So calming the smooth muscle cells in the stomach reduces the stomach writhing around. That helps to get rid of the feeling of sickness. Uh, calming the muscles in the small bowel and the large bowel helps to reduce the abdominal pain, helps to prevent abdominal cramps and helps to relieve some of the diarrhea. So it is an extremely good medicine for helping to treat IBS. Uh, and s we hope that they'll just need to take it on a PRM basis. So just when their symptoms are bad, when they're really struggling with the pain or the nausea, uh, but some of them will regularly uh, will end up taking it regularly. So they might take it in the morning and in the evening every single day. If that's not controlling it, then they might increase the dose up to a maximum of 20 milligrams four times a day. So it is an effective medicine for treating IBS. Uh, it doesn't cure it, of course. It's just uh, covering up the symptoms, but uh, it is nevertheless very effective at doing that.